Welcome to the Harmony of Interest series, where we explore ideas that positively shape our world. My name is Evan Papp, and I'm the executive producer for Empathy Media Lab that publishes content on labor, political economy, art, and culture. We are a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. I'm very excited to talk to Dr. June Hopkins, who received her PhD in American history from Georgia University and is Professor Emerita at Georgia Southern University. She is also the granddaughter of one of my heroes, Harry Hopkins, and she is the author of Harry Hopkins, Sudden Hero, Brash Reformer. Dr. Hopkins, thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. I'm very glad to be here. I went through school in public policy and political science, and there is very little discussion about the New Deal. And there's very little discussion about people like your grandfather, Harry Hopkins. And before we start talking about him, I would like to learn a little bit more about you. And uh, could you talk about where you grew up and why you want to become a professor? Well, I grew up in New York and, and Los Angeles for part of the time. I'm sort of bi-coastal. And I went to Berkeley for my undergraduate. I was an English major. And I wasn't at all interested in history. That came later. And then I got my master's in public administration, became a social worker in New York City for about five years. And then I decided to become a historian for some reason. A a lot of it was to find out more about my grandfather. So I went to Georgetown and wrote my doctoral dissertation on Hopkins and his social work career. And that became essentially the book. And then I got a job teaching in Georgia. And uh, I taught there for 18 years, retired three years ago. And here I am. And what was your experience about talking to people in your generation about the New Deal when you were going to college at Berkeley? Oh, nobody knew anything about it then. Uh, Of course, this was Berkeley in the 60s, remember. We were more interested in the free speech movement and Mario Savio and love children back then. So I was an English major in, in, at Berkeley. So I, I wasn't talking about my grandfather. We talked about him at home. He, he was our grandfather. I come from a very large family and we required reading when we were, I don't know, young teenagers was the Sherwood book, Roosevelt and Hopkins, which is a big, thick book. And, and we were all, we all read it. But I didn't know that much about my grandfather. I mean, you read a book when you're 12 years old, you don't retain much. Uh, so I really, I really found my grandfather as an academic, as a historian. I was five years old when he died, so I never knew him. I got to know him by reading his letters, some of his diary. He, he kept a really sparse diary. And, and I, I knew him through the documents. And I became very much in awe of him. His, his administrative skills, his ability to cut through red tape, to get things done, it's remarkable. It was really good. And now I'm working on a book on his career during World War II, and especially his relationship with Winston Churchill. And, and he carried his idea about social justice into the war years. I mean, this was, was always in the back of his mind. Equality, social justice, caring for the underdog, the idea that government has a responsibility to, to do this. Uh, and he never lost that. And, and during the war years, uh, the defeat of fascism was the ultimate social justice for him, for the world. So I, I learned many things about him and, and my admiration grew as the more I read about him, the more I realized, first of all, he was pretty sick for a lot of the time during the war. And he died at age 55. Uh, he worked himself to death. Essentially. So before we talk about his his uh, later life, he was born in Iowa. And could you talk yes. a little bit about his his upbringing in from my understanding of a religious family? Well, yeah, his mother was a Methodist and his father was a bowler. He was what the, you know, a money bowler. He bowled for money, which just horrified Anna, the, his wife. He grew up in this little house in in Grinnell, which is right on campus. It's now called the Harry Hopkins house and had five kids. The father was a, a shopkeeper, had a shop in the little village where people bought their pens and pencils and pads and all kinds of stuff. You know, it was really like, like an old five and dime, the way they used to be, but it was small. But he went to Grinnell, as did his brothers and sister. And then he was sort of steeped in the social gospel there. This was a, a very progressive college that, that began in the 1875, I think. But the faculty were social gospelers. So Hopkins took 
courses in what he called, what's called applied Christianity, which would probably be sociology now. And Edward Steiner, who was one of the social gospels, was one of his teachers. And so when he graduated, he decided that he wanted to get away from Grinnell, for one thing. And he traveled across the country with his friend, Lewis Hartson, to New York. He was going to follow in his sister's footsteps and go work at a settlement house. And he stopped along the way at the um, Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention. He saw Teddy Roosevelt bolt and form his own party. And then he saw Woodrow Wilson, who was his hero, win the election. And then he went to New York and was a social worker at the settlement house. And there, there he met my grandmother and they got married. And then he worked for social agencies. He worked for the AICP, the Association for Improving the Conditions of the Poor. And then he worked for the Bureau of Child Welfare, which administered widows' pensions, which is the forerunner of ADC, what we call welfare. And then he joined the, the Red Cross when he went, during World War I, which a lot of social workers did. He, he couldn't get into the service because he had bad eyesight and worked for the Red Cross in New Orleans and Atlanta, went back to New York City and worked for the, the New York Tuberculosis Association, did wonderful work there. And under his tutelage, it became the New York Tuberculosis and Heart Association. And then 1928, he met Roosevelt. We don't really know when exactly and how, but we know it was during the campaign for governorship. And Roosevelt won the governorship in 28 and again in 30. And of course, then the depression had just hit. And when Roosevelt thought of this new program, the Temporary Emergency Relief Administration, to give money to people in New York who were in need. Some of them were really, really in bad shape. Hopkins ran the TERA. Um, and other states sort of followed. Roosevelt had a, a governor's conference in New York, and many governors came and took that as a, a model for their state programs to provide government funds for unemployed workers to first give them money and then to start the job. Now the TERA was the first jobs program on a state level. Then when Roosevelt ran for president in 32 and was inaugurated in 33, Hopkins followed him to DC. He wasn't called, he just followed. Because Roosevelt didn't know him very well at this point. He got Roosevelt's ear by going through Francis Perkins who was the, the state industrial commissioner. And she gave Roosevelt the plan that Hopkins had for a federal emergency relief administration, the FERA. And it was one of many. And Roosevelt liked it and named Hopkins federal relief administrator. And that's when it all began. And this is coming after the Hoover administration with Secretary of Treasury Andrew Mellon, who was a treasurer secretary from, for three presidents. And through the 1929 till they were ousted by FDR, Mellon's whole philosophy was liquidate everything, liquidate the farmers, liquidate all the extra labor and things like that. And if it's throwing humans on the trash heap of history, so be it, because there, there's no way to commodify them. And so there's this complete 180 degree turn with FDR coming in with these folks in his cabinet. And, and Frances Perkins was one of the first female cabinet uh, secretaries, I believe. As the secretary. first, the first. The first. The first, yeah. And she was with him for all of his administrations. She and Harold Ickes were the only two who lasted the whole time. She, she was wonderful. But Mellon, you know, this was cut, the, cut taxes for the rich. So the Roosevelt administration was a complete about face from the Hoover administration. And even though Roosevelt ran his campaign on balancing the budget, it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to happen. It, it was the idea, my grandfather's book is called Spending to Save. And it was, it was written in 33. And it was the idea that if you're in a recession or depression, you would, it's Keynesian, you inject money in, into it. And this is what Roosevelt did. He, and Hopkins was great at spending other people's money. I mean, this was something he could do. He never had his own money, but he could spend other people's money. And it's so amazing that even today, people think that 
when you have austerity and you actually cut the budget, it's, it ha has this loop effect that you're shrinking the amount of, of spending and you're actually going to contract the entire economy when the, when the government is the spender of last resort. And yet we yeah. still hear people pushing this because this is what oftentimes Wall Street and the financier class wants. Well, the idea of spending what was a crucial part of the New Deal. It, it was the idea that the problem was caused by overproduction and underconsumption. And when you do that, the, the, how, how can businesses thrive if people aren't buying their products? And if the workers can't buy the product that they make, then businesses are not gonna be able to, 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 to maintain any kind of, of presence in, in America. So it was, in, Roosevelt wanted to not only help the unemployed, which was one of his first on the agenda, but to make sure that business and agriculture were, were stable as well. And, and his programs that came out in the first hundred days were meant to do that. Now the, the AAA and the NIRA maybe not, didn't work exactly as well as they were, they were meant to, but Roosevelt had this thing, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try something. If it doesn't work, we'll dump it and we'll try something else. And that was very effective. The jobs programs, the first FERA was giving money out to people who, who were in need. And that's the Federal Emergency Relief Administration that yeah. was created in the first 100 days. The FERA was the first one and they gave money out to people. They just handed money out because people were starving and they were homeless. And then Hopkins said, people want to work. So he, he created a work component of the FERA. So the unemployed worker would get a federally subsidized job that would, they would be able to work off what they call their estimated budget deficiency. So it would be a social worker involved, seeing how much do you need and you're gonna work these days and these many hours to work off that fee we're paying you. And that you know, worked for a while, but come 1933 in November, the winter ahead was gonna be really severe. And that always makes it a lot harder for people who are unemployed and poor and, and really in dire straits. So Hopkins suggested what came to be the Civil Works Administration, which had no such thing as a social worker involved. They were real jobs, useful work for real wages. They were given the prevailing wage. You didn't have to be on relief. You didn't have to be on welfare. They called relief back then. And he, he, he proposed it on November 9th. On November 20th, all the people on the FERA rolls were transferred to the CWA rolls. And Hopkins put 4 million people to work in four months and spent a good deal of money, probably $4 million on top of it. This was going to be temporary. So it ended in the spring and in 1934. And that's when Hopkins be begins to, to think about a more permanent way to make sure that Americans have some kind of stability and, and what he called economic security. Every time I think about that type of government coming in and seeing a need and actually delivering and the previous government and most of my life, I'm, I'm uh, 42 and I've grown up in the Reagan arena where mm -hmm. everything is you know, very much focused on supporting Wall Street and Wall Street's needs. And hopefully we can get stuff to trickle down. And unfortunately, a lot of the Democratic Party turned from the New Deal Democrats to New Democrats. And that's a whole nother history that we could get into in another time. But the ability to put that millions of people back to work in the matter of months is, and, and this is time where there's not this technology, there isn't this supposed no. advancement in civilization and they're yeah. able to do it. And yet we're still sometimes dragging our feet trying to figure out how to solve some of these issues where the private sector clearly is failing to create jobs. So the government needs to step in. The private sector will never be able to absorb every worker who wants a job, good times or bad times. It, it'll never happen. So my theory and the theory of my colleagues of the New Deal descendants believe that the government has to be the employer of last resort. And that's why these the jobs programs is such an important part of Biden's administration. To back up a little bit, in, in 1934, Roosevelt created the Committee for Economic Security and put Francis Perkins as chair for this. And he, and he told this committee 
which is made up of cabinet members and my grandfather as federal relief administrator, to write legislation to, pr to protect Americans from cradle to grave, to protect them against what he called the vicissitudes of modern life. And they wrote this legislation and rewrote it and rewrote it. And, and while it was being written, part of the, the, the text said that there should be a, a, a permanent government jobs program in this, in this legislation. And Hopkins wanted to call it the, the Job Assurance Corporation. And for him, this was the, the ultimate way that unemployment could be mitigated no matter what kind of economy we had up or down, but that never got into the final legislation for the Social Security Act. And that was a great disappointment for him. And of course, health insurance didn't even, also didn't get in. So because that didn't get in, Roosevelt gave him as a consolation prize, the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. 1935. This is part of this, what we call the Second New Deal, the Social Security Act, WPA, and, and the Wagner Act. But the WPA lasted from 35 to 42, and, and Hopkins ran it, called the Hopkins Machine, and did some really wonderful work. There's a Living New Deal. I don't know if you, you know about the, the Living New Deal. Have you gone on their map? It's incredible. And I yeah. oftentimes, the, the Living New Deal, I go to cities and I look up at the Living New Deal just so I can go see some New Deal uh, projects. So. Now they have now a, a Living New Deal map, physical map of, 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 of Washington, D.C. Has it, it's just come out. Have you, did, did you get one? I need to take a look at that. I have not. So my grandparents were some of the first public housing, and this was Works Progress Administration in uh -huh. Cleveland, Ohio. And I actually did a little short uh, piece on that and just how it saved them after they lost their house. And so we're forever a New Deal family. Good. good. Um, so, the New Deal is, is something that we have to recover. We have to recoup that attitude that uh, the government is the servant of the people, not vice versa. So within the WPA, can you talk a little bit about what type of work was given out and just as I understood it, there were people who have been unemployed for many years at the time because of the stock market crash, 1929. We're looking at 1935. And so there's almost a whole generation of individuals that have never been in the workforce. And this is, in a way, brings them in to the workforce and gives them a hand up. A good number of the jobs uh, for the WPA were infrastructure, building things, you know, roads, airports, schoolyards, and, and, and many of them were men, adult men. There were men who were working on the road in their business suits because they didn't have work clothes. But there was also a, a women's and professional division run by Ellen Woodward that provided jobs for women, but they, they, they were sort of women's jobs, you know, canning, sewing, distributing food, school lunches, teaching. And then there was a famous federal one, which was the arts and culture program, which was, I got a lot of flack from the press and from a lot of people, but it was wonderful. When you think about the, the people who were in the arts, painters and musicians and actors, writers, I mean, their, their jobs were, were gone too, because nobody exactly. was buying art. Nobody was, I mean, they, they were reading books, but they were not publishing a lot. So Federal One was a, a way that these, these cultural icons could be preserved. And it also brought art and culture to middle America. I mean, these little towns in America that had never seen a live orchestra, they, they would have orchestra performances. The Federal Theater Project, run by Hallie Flanagan, who was an old college school, schoolmate of, of Hopkins, plays would be circulated all over the country, live theater, which was wonderful. So it, it had an effect on the infrastructure of America, had, had an effect on the, the minds and the culture of America. And, and it, it provided the dignity of work for a wage instead of a government handout. Hopkins was very, very clear about that. He said, give a man a dole, which was a handout, and you save his body. Give him a job and assured wage and you save both his mind and his body. So a job is an integral part of anybody's psyche. It's what you do and what, how you, you earn your money. 
And when the bottom falls out of the economy, like it did in, in, in 30s, people were, were just at a loss. They didn't know what had happened. How can this happen to me? I've had a middle class job all my life. We, we went on holidays and I had a house. Everything's gone. Now what do I do? So I, you know, the, either the government stepping in at that point was sort of unheard of then, but people caught on to it pretty quickly. And if the government doesn't step in, then you have 1933 Hitler coming in at the same time. And you have all these people who are losing their place in society. And they are just easy pickings for demagogues and fascists. Exactly. Like, well, look, Father Coughlin, that, that, that kind of person. And it, it, it was a remarkable arc that Adolf Hitler and Franklin Roosevelt became leaders of their nations at the same time and essentially died within months of each other. And the idea of protecting America against fascism was, even, even though Roosevelt wasn't really concerned with international affairs during the 30s, he, he knew what was going on. And the idea of saving American democracy was very, very important. And democracy and capitalism were part of, of America for him. And he wasn't gonna let anything happen to those two ideals. So to get a little bit into the weeds, and I do want to talk a little bit more about Harry Hopkins' time in, in World War II and then kind of turn it to present day. So the PWA, the Public Works Administration, I've read some things that Harold Ickes and Harry Hopkins, they were sometimes in disagreement. The Public Works Administration oftentimes was about larger infrastructure and the Works Progress uh, Administration, WPA, was ran by Harry Hopkins. Was there some tension between those two and these two programs at that time? Yeah, there was, because both of them were vying for Roosevelt's attention and Roosevelt's dollars. And in, in some instances, PWA money was taken away to give to Hopkins for his CWA. And, and they, they were at loggerheads a lot, but they had great respect for each other. Even though they were on different tracks, they all, always got along. I mean, deep down, they always got along. Publicly, there, there was some scrapping, but nothing that, that was denigrated to either of them. And it's such an interesting kind of background where you have FDR, who is essentially an American aristocrat coming from the Hudson Valley. And he can trace his lineage back to Isaac Roosevelt with the Revolutionary yeah. uh, Guard in the 1700s. And then Harry Hopkins. And Harry Hopkins eventually moves into the White House, as I understand it. And he becomes the personal emissary to Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin during World War II. And he's also the key policymaker behind the Lend-Lease program that sent a lot of U.S. manufacturing war equipment to the Soviet Union and to the British and to other allies at that time. Right. Talk about that dynamic. May 10th, 1940, Hitler invades the lowlands. Winston Churchill becomes prime minister of, of Great Britain. And Harry Hopkins moved into the White House. And he stays for three and a half years. And after Roosevelt won the 1940 election, he goes out on the Potomac on his ship, his, his private yacht, with Hopkins and, and Pa Watson. And Churchill sends them a 4,000-word letter. Please help us, because France is gone. Great Britain is standing alone against Germany. And Roosevelt reads this and goes into a meditation, I guess you could say. And he comes up with Lend-Lease, the idea of... of lending Great Britain what they need to fight off the British. And then when the war is over, they give it back to us. And he says, I need to meet with Churchill. I need to see if we give him those the munitions, will they hold out or will they give them to the Germans? And he sends Harry Hopkins over to England to meet with Churchill and to assess you know, whether or not Great Britain is strong enough and whether Churchill is a strong enough leader that we can take the chance. And we didn't have a lot of munitions back then. I mean, we were building up the arsenal of democracy, they said, but we need to know. So Hopkins goes over there and spends four and a half weeks with Churchill and spends most of the time in the company of Churchill being taken around and shown installations and munitions and be being taken into meetings. And they get along like a house on fire. Churchill and, and, and Hopkins, they and talked about different 
backgrounds. I mean, they, they're, they're even farther apart than Hopkins and Roosevelt. And, and Winston Churchill's family went back to the Duke of Marlboro years before. And, and here's Hopkins, this kind of hayseed from Iowa, but he had this ability to read people, to connect with people, to understand how to talk to them. And he endeared himself to the British people as well. They didn't know what he was gonna report back to Roosevelt because they were desperate. They were really desperate. And they're in Scotland seen off Lord Halifax, who's going to be the new ambassador to, to the United States from Great Britain. And at, at a dinner, Hopkins stands up and gives an unexpected toast. And he, he says, from the book of Ruth, whither thou goest, I shall go, your people will be my people. And then he ends the whole quote, even to the end. And Churchill at that point knew what Hopkins was going to report back to, to Roosevelt, which he did. And he said, you got to give them as much as we can possibly give him because they are our only hope of holding out against the Germans. Because if Britain falls, we're in trouble. So then Lend-Lease is passed while he's there. He comes back and he, he administers Lend-Lease. And this is at a time where in the United States, there is also growing fascism. So... Oh. There is Father Coughlin from Detroit. You, you have the famous aviator, Lindbergh, Lindbergh who, yeah. who is also a fascist and, and pro-Nazi. You have a lot of Wall Street who have a lot of investments in Germany at that time with IG Farben and the, the Nazi cartels. And even the British crown, there's folks behind them who are aligned with the Nazis. So there's this point where Roosevelt, his hands are tied to come out directly and declare war. And so this Lend-Lease is kind of a, a ways around it. But it's really interesting and, and horrifying at Wall Street's ability to just support the worst of the worst just to make money. And I feel I in know. some ways nothing has changed. <laughs> well, yeah, let's hope that we'll get a leader like Roosevelt who will make changes. But yes, and, and America first, the, this big isolationist block and the German Bund was holding meetings in Madison Square Garden with tens of thousands of people with the Nazi salute. And you know, it was frightening when you look back at it. But Roosevelt knew that, or he, the way he presented to the American people was that the only way we can prevent war is by bolstering up the British so that they, that, that they can fight the Germans. He says, I hate war. I've seen war, I hate war. You know, in the, the Roosevelt Memorial in, in DC, that big, stone that says, I hate war. And, and I can remember Hopkins asking him, why don't we just declare war? I mean, why don't we just try to? And he says, no, we need an incident. We need an incident. He knew that if he asked Congress to declare war, Congress would not declare war. It would be a terrible political hit. But Lend-Lease was the best we could do for Britain at that point. And it's kind of like Lincoln waiting for the South and the Confederates to fire first and the shots on Fort Sumter, because morally you got to be on the right side of history and you can't, can't lead with the first, the first punch. And yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of cynicism and pessimism today when they hear the arsenal of democracy. However, what Roosevelt was doing towards the end of the war, he introduced the second uh, Bill of Rights or an economic Bill of Rights, yes. which would guarantee every American a job, healthcare, housing, time for leisure, and it goes on and on. And he also put four freedoms on the back of a lot of the service men and women's medals that talked about, we're fighting for something. And it, what we're fighting for is these four freedoms, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of speech, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. And that's something also that has been completely lacking in my entire lifetime in all these yeah. military escapades to have any vision or to have any reason of any of these pointless wars. And my father also was drafted in Vietnam as well. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like yeah. one stupid thing after another. And you can see where this cynicism grows. But at that time, this arsenal of democracy had a real vision and a real symbolic conceptual understanding of what what they were fighting for. And, and of course, it was a way to marshal the unemployed to work in these factories and, and pull up this amazing feat 
of, of the tens of thousands of airplanes and battleships that, and munitions that, that, that we managed to, to, to create, which nobody thought we could do, but it was an incredible show of American industrial strength and American know-how. And, and the war was won with American machines. This was not a war of men. It was a war of machines. And even Stalin admitted that. He could not have fought without American munitions as well as the British. And it was, it was amazing how quickly they, they could get this, the planes out. And it was different types of investments like the Tennessee Valley Authority that turned the backwardness and the lack of reconstruction after the Civil War in Tennessee and create an actual modern economy of low uh, electricity costs and then going into the Northwest with a lot of the different types of dams and you know, that allowed for manufacturing to be done at a very efficient, you know, price of energy use and things like that. So Harry Hopkins was also sick for much of his time from a cancer in the stomach. And as you mentioned, he died in 1946 at the age of 55. And I find it interesting how some of my heroes in American presidential leadership, like FDR, he had polio, Kennedy had tremendous back problems, also had Addison's disease, and he, he was very sickly for most of his life. Lincoln lost his child. How do you think that affected Harry Hopkins as he's fighting to survive, but he's still fighting for this greater cause? Yeah, it, it's really interesting. And, and I've, I've been pondering that the, the more I, I read about him and the more I study him. His, his illness uh, he never really let it interfere, although, you know, he did spend time at the Mayo Clinic at certain points during, during the, the 30s and 40s and before he died. But he pushed through. It's interesting to note that during the Great Depression, he fed lots of people and he himself was essentially starving to death because he couldn't digest proteins. He had what we want not know a celiac disease. So he had a whole series of illnesses, but he, he managed to go on these airplane flights that were you know, 24 hours long and not comfortable and, and all the traveling that he did to the conferences. It took a great deal of, of his energy and, and I think essentially it killed him. Uh, he died nine months after Roosevelt died. He went on one last trip to Moscow under President Truman. That was even hard for him, but, but he got out of a sick bed to do it. It, it energized him, his work energized him, gave him a, a mission and it, it uh, allowed him to keep going. His, his real deep belief that he was doing really important work that was going to affect millions of people. And I think that allowed him to keep going even though he was really sick. And so much of the spirit of the New Deal has not been able to be extinguished despite the reactionary forces in America. You, you still have social security that is one of the most yep. popular programs. There, there are so many different types of government regulations and, and a dirigistic mixed economy that was brought about through the New Deal. And this is something that we need to keep fighting for and, and something that I'm always really alarmed. I read this book from written by Elliot Roosevelt, who is one of FDR's children called As He Saw It. And in this book, Elliot Roosevelt wrote in 1946, and he talked about his times working with his father and going to the Casablanca conference where he was able to meet with Stalin and Churchill, also a, another conference in Tehran, another meeting with Churchill. And it was very eye-opening of the idea of what post-World War II was supposed to look like and that Roosevelt was never able to see implemented because he died in April 1945, shortly before the end of the war. And soon after he died, you have the entire Wallace side of Roosevelt's faction being completely purged. You have Harry Hopkins dying shortly thereafter. And you have uh, Winston Churchill going to Missouri and giving the Iron Curtain speech yeah. at Harry Truman's old university in, in, in Missouri, and really kind of creating another clash between the Soviet Union and the United States with Britain becoming the fulcrum point where FDR's whole idea was the empires of France and Britain and Netherlands and Spain were going to have to ultimately re remove their colonialism. And the U.S. was going to be the mediator between the Soviet Union and the British and Western European colonialists. 
And then this crazy shift away from something that was so successful and then the reactionary Wall Street factions coming in and, and really taking uh, much greater control than would have happened if Roosevelt remained alive. Yeah, Ro Roosevelt was at, at Yalta. He, he firmly believed that in the post-war world, he would have a say. He would be able to control Stalin. He really felt that, that he and Stalin made a connection, especially at Tehran, when Roosevelt kind of cut out Churchill and made cozied up to, to Stalin, that, that he really felt that there was a connection. And Hopkins too, when Hopkins went to Moscow to visit Stalin after Barbarossa, he spent three days meeting with Stalin. While he recognized that this man was a tyrant and this man was a dictator, he also knew that he had such an iron hand over his country that the, the Red Army would fight and and to win the war for us because they were the ones that, that, that had boots on the ground. But both of these men, knew Stalin and, and really believed that they would be able to control. Well, in the aftermath of, of the war, when, when Truman took over, that, that changed the complexion totally. It, it, it was a real, now, the what ifs, if Henry Wallace had been vice president, he would have been president, it would have been a very, very different story, a very different story. And, and that's really too bad it didn't happen. But I think that that would have controlled things. Things spun out of control after that, after that. The Cold War disrupted any kind of world order that Roosevelt had in mind and Hopkins had in mind. And it was a very different America in the 50s and 60s than, than in the 30s and 40s. So looking at today, you wrote an open letter to Joe Biden this summer before he was president in the American Prospect with James Roosevelt Jr., where you were calling on the incoming president to be bolder than FDR on jobs. Could you talk a bit about this article and what you're demanding? Yeah, Biden was talking about a new deal in Roosevelt. We wanted him to do that, yes, but the, the new deal had gaps in it, right? It, it didn't pay attention to racism. It didn't pay attention to gender bias, and, and it really didn't have a lot to do with voting rights. So these are some of the things that we wanted him to build on the, the New Deal as a model and, and do X, Y, Z, and, and, and to build back better. We're sending him out another letter tomorrow. Uh, there'll be a press release on, on Dear President Biden saying that, you, you know, the, the Jobs for Economic Recovery Act, which is a bill that is in in the Senate, on the Senate floor now, we're asking him to support that, as well as to support the new CCC, the Civilian, not Conservation Corps, but the Civilian Climate Corps, as models of the, of the New Deal that we, we can use now. And the CCC could be a really good program now because it could engage young men, it could engage vets, veterans who are, who are you know, new, newly retired from the service. And there's a lot of work that can be done, not just planting trees and building dams, but broadband. This kind of thing is really important. You know, the, the, the rural electrification during the New Deal could be a broadband program now. So what we're, we're asking him as descendants, it's, it's Jim Roosevelt, Scott Wallace, Harold Ickes, who was Harold Ickes' son, not grandson, Tomlin, Perkins, Cockleshell, and me signing the, the letter. It's going to go out tomorrow. I'll definitely link to that as well yeah. and try to give it as much publicity as I can. Good. There's a lot of talk today about the UBI or universal basic income. And mm -hmm. I am absolutely for people who need welfare should get welfare. But as you said before, the private sector cannot ensure everyone is employed. And if we want full employment, then the government has to come in and provide jobs. At the same time, I totally agree with you that the work provides dignity and it helps with the spirit. And if the work is actually meaningful and going towards an actual national purpose of regeneration and rebuilding, it can actually create tremendous cohesion that we're currently lacking in this country. But I just wanted to ask you, what are some of your thoughts about the UBI? I, I don't like it very much. I like the, I mean, if you're going to spend money, yeah, it's easier and cheaper just hand out money. But to use that money to create jobs that are going to improve our infrastructure, are going to improve our forests, are going to improve our broadband, you're giving people 
a, an occupation, a job, something to do, which builds up their spirit, and you have a, a, a return on your in, investment. You know, so it seems to me that this is a much better way to spend government money than universal basic income. And there's so much work to be done. When you look at oh, our entire gosh. municipal drinking water systems are leaking arsenic today and that yeah. haven't been built, you know, since the last, you know, depression, there's so much work to be done. And those are skills. And I'm very much a proponent of union labor and union wage yes. jobs. Yes. So let's indeed. make them all union. And you're bringing a new generation of, of people up who can see production, see the value of this work. And I, I couldn't agree more. So Good. I really appreciate exactly. everything you're doing on that front. Yeah. So in closing, what are some of your thoughts of optimism as uh, we head into the spring of 2021? I got a great boost in optimism when Joe Biden was inaugurated, I'll tell you that. And from what he's done so far, I, 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 I'm really optimistic about the future of this country. I think we have to worry about the Senate. I think we have to worry about getting the bills that he is proposing passed through the Senate, and I don't know what's going to happen with the filibuster. It, it seems to me that Rule 22 could be altered or some, or that there's some ways to get around so that things, so that there's not this brick wall that we can, that any senator, Republican senator can create, just by waving his hand and say, I'm going to filibuster. And then suddenly nothing is going to get through. So I, I would really like to be able to build on Biden's momentum when, when he got the, this rescue plan pass and see, see, you know, get some things through, allow a debate to take place, but then cut it off after a certain time or, or make them stand up for, you know, 15 hours and talk. Yeah. And not send their assistants up there as some people. Yeah, no, no, let them do it. Um, I mean, I, but, yeah. I would have never thought that Biden would be, if he can pass, he just passed a rescue package. If he gets this infrastructure bill passed, if he gets the new CCC, if he gets the PRO Act, which is a pro-union protecting right to organize act. Mm -hmm. And if you can get this democracy reform bill done before yeah. the, the midterm election, that I think will be equivalent to something that we saw in the first two years of FDR. And maybe the $15 minimum wage. Let's try for that too, <laughs> you know? And I, I, I just, I, I hope that there can be some way to work across the aisle so that they can see what's best for the United States and not just what's best for, for their re-election plans. And so I'm optimistic. I am optimistic. So where can people find your book on Harry Hopkins and where should where can they follow some of the agitation that you're doing with the descendants of the New Deal? Well, info at 21stCenturyNewDeal.org. I think that should be it. If not, if not I'll send it to you. Great. And I'll make sure it's in the show notes as well. Yeah. So Dr. June Hopkins, thank you so much for your time and all the work that you're doing. And I look forward to seeing you in the trenches. Okay. I thank you very much for this invitation. I enjoyed it very much.